right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, wow, it's I can't believe the timing already. It, the last month has gone by so fast, but we are on the 15th session of the applying for a draw and answering questions. Um, we've had so many biologists and um, different people from the department on, and um, hopefully we've been able to answer a lot of your questions. Um, but tonight we are going to have a free for all basically and answer as many questions as we can possibly answer because we are less than 48 hours from the end of the of the big game draw application period so if you haven't already applied get your applications in by 5 p.m on wednesday the 16th uh there's no taking them after after that time there's no late entries there's no like i started them but didn't finish them at, at 5 p.m the system shuts down it kicks everything out so if you haven't done it get it done soon uh, if you haven't logged into your account i would recommend doing that pretty quickly um because if you need help getting a password reset we currently, right now, we have about a dozen people answering the phones, the 1-800 number that's up on the screen there, 1-888-248-6866. And I can tell you the wait time is currently zero. So log in right now, because we are taking calls until eight o'clock tonight and then tomorrow from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So if you need help resetting a password or putting in for a specific hunt code, um, send a question because Colleen and I are going to answer it as, must, as best we can. And But we also have people that are standing by on the phones ready to help you. Uh, I do have our Spanish translator here with us. And so if you have a question that you'd be more comfortable asking in Spanish, we can bring Darren in and he'll translate for us. Let's see, what else am I missing? Um, for those of you that are here in, in a Zoom with us, go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A. We will start working through those here in just a minute. And for those of you that are on Facebook, we are gonna keep an eye on those as well. Um, I'm gonna do a quick shout out to a friend Kenson because he's watched every episode and I, I really appreciate his support. So thanks Kenson. Um, so yes, so get your applications in. Um, if you've had a Barbary tag, Ibex, Evelina Oryx or Trapper, you have until April 7th to get that in. So, so don't delay, start working on that. And like I said, give us a call if you guys have questions or type it into the chat. But Colleen, I wanna start with you because um, you, this is your first time joining us on the <laughs> webinar series. And so can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what your job is and kind of what you do on a day in and day out basis? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Tristiana, so much for having me tonight. It's great to be able to kind of do some of these events and answer a lot of questions that we get from the public, because uh, it certainly helps us in the type of information that we try uh, to put out to the public. So my name is Colleen Payne. I'm the public information specialist for the Southwest area. So I work out of the Las Cruces office um, and cover the whole Southwest corner of the state, but also, of course, help our team uh, across the state as well with different events programs and um, activities that we're doing. So day in the life of a public information specialist can vary a lot. And especially right now with the draw, we are all hands on deck focusing on getting everybody applied for the draw, getting questions answered, passwords reset, um, everything that we can to help you guys get your um, applications in and hopefully send you a little bit of luck to draw some tags this year. Um, but the, the best part of my job that um, I really get to focus on is I get to highlight all of the programs, the activities, events, uh, different uh, research pro projects, habitat projects, uh, any sort of education and outreach that our department is doing and promote that to the public. Uh, so I get to work a lot with the public on doing different seminars, uh, whether it's uh, on Zoom or it is in person just getting out and kind of being a representation for our department and our area. And we've got um, some really awesome things that are going on across the state, but also in our area too. So it's great to see all the hard work that our uh, teams are working on to do for the state and for wildlife in New Mexico. Absolutely. And I want to plug one of the programs because I know next week you are um, hosting, you're helping to host a lady social hour on Tuesday evening to talk about turkey hunting, yep. right? Yes, uh, you know, those webinars have been super informational and helpful the last, you know, couple of years that the department's been doing them. I started uh, participating in them, you know, as just a person of the public. And so now I get to help um, put them on. So I'm super excited. Turkey season's right around the corner. So um, if there's any ladies that are joining us tonight or uh, anyone who has ladies that are interested in learning about turkey hunting, 
Um, this is going to be a fantastic topic. We've got Helen Butt, I think, joining us that week. And uh, I'm excited to learn some more stuff about turkey hunting as well. Wow. I've yet to harvest a turkey. And last year I was like, I'm going to learn and go do it. And I went and hunted, but I didn't actually get one. <laughs> so <laughs> it maybe is, It's a learning year. process for sure. And they're, they're smart animals. So every time you get out there, you get to learn a little bit more. All right. So I want to jump in. I have some questions and we have a few coming in on, on chat here, but I want to start with one that I have gotten so many times today. And it's basically, if someone's interested in applying for the draw, what do they, what do they need to know? For starters, the biggest thing that you need is to create a customer account with our department. That is the first step. And that is the way to uh, get your application submitted and get all the correct information that we need in order to process that application um, and get you in the draw. So first thing is you can go to our website, go to customer login, create an account. It's gonna ask you some prompts to collect some information from you if you don't already have an account. It's like a four or five step process, super easy. Once you've created that account, then you are able to not only register or apply for uh, draw hunts, but you're able to register for any hunter education classes, OHV classes, take your fur bear or trapper um, identification course, your cougar ID course. If you want to become a guide or an outfitter, you can do your registration on that account too. It's basically your customer portal and holds all things that is, that's associated to you. So once you've created that account, um, the next thing that you should do is take a really big look through the rule and information booklet that has all of the new rules for the 2022-2023 season um, and all of the season dates, weapon choices, and uh, game management units for each species. So if you're interested in applying for pronghorn, you can go to the pronghorn section, uh, take a look at all the different units where pronghorn hunts are going to take place next year. And you can look at the different weapon types and the season dates and weapon types correspond with what we refer to as a hunt code. Uh, so for antelope, for instance, it's going to be ANT-1-100, for, for example. That hunt code is what you are going to need to apply uh, your application. Um, having season dates or having units definitely helps you narrow it down, but having that specific hunt code is what is needed to apply you whether you're doing it yourself online on your own um, account, or if you're calling in to the 188 number, or even if you come by one of the area offices, please have those hunt codes ready to apply because it makes the process 10 times easier uh, to get the correct dates and units applied for you. Um, it, it takes some time to make sure to kind of narrow those down and see what schedules look like and make sure you're not overlapping anything or what your application strategy might be. Um, but once you have those hunt codes selected, makes the application process super simple. And then the last thing that you need is just gonna uh, need a valid credit card, or if you're coming by the office, some cash. Uh, getting those paid for up front and uh, getting your application submitted is the biggest thing uh, in order to get applied for the draw. I think I covered everything on there. Um, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm missing something, remind me, but... Um, Getting your account created and your hunt code selected is the biggest thing that you'll need for your application. Um, Absolutely. Tristana, the, went, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, the one thing I would add is that if you have ever hunted or fished in New Mexico, you likely have an account already. Mm -hmm. And so if you um, can't get in, if it's um, you know not letting you in, or it says it's not activated, or you need a password reset, that's easy. Just holler at us and we can, we can help with that. But I know I've had to reactivate several accounts today. Yes, we, we do it quite often. It's uh, very easy to forget passwords, especially with all the different accounts and online stuff that we've had to do lately. Um, so if, if anyone's having any issues of not being able to get into your account, just give us a call. We can get it reset for you. Um, and pro tip, if you can't remember your username, it's also going to be your CIN number. So if you've already created an account and say you've had um, a license in the past, that CIN number is going to be on your license. Um, it's usually your date of birth followed by three letters. You can use that as your username um, and that hopefully that might help you uh, reset it on your own as well. 
Um, but if you're still having issues getting in, just give us a call. We've, we've been doing a lot of password resets, so not a problem. We're happy to help. Perfect. And I think you have a screen pulled up to show everybody where to find the proclamation or the rules and information booklet and the hunt codes. Right? I do. Um, so let me get that screen shared. <clears throat> While you're doing that, I'm going to take one of the questions that came in about the early applications. For those of you that have got it done, um, our IT department is running the analysis so that we can see who came out in that, um, who will win those prizes that were donated from our partners. And then we'll also be sending out the um, codes for the discounts to uh, Federal, Remington, and OnX. So those will be coming out probably next week, but we are running the 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 stats right now so we can get that get that out there and get those people that win those connected with the vendor so awesome cool. and you have the page up there that's perfect I, timing i do so um if you go to our website which is wildlife.state.nm.us uh you'll hover hover over the home drop down menu, menu and you'll see another option that says publications click on that and it'll take you to all the rule and information booklets uh, for the current year and even the past years, if you want to take a look at those, um, some of our other uh, booklets are still being finalized, so you'll see them get uploaded on here once those are ready. Um, but you'll see the 2022-2023 hunting uh, rule and information booklet has this gorgeous elk on the cover, um, and you can do a couple things. You can download the entire PDF right here. What I like to do is download a copy of it, save it to my desktop. And I can open and review that anytime instead of having to come to the website. Also works if you don't have internet, um, you already have the PDF downloaded. You can also download this to your phone or to your mobile device. That way you have it handy while you're out in the field as well. Uh, we do have limited supplies of printed proclamations this year. So, and they're only available at our area offices. So if you're not able to come by and pick one up from us, Here's two other ways that you can have it downloaded and on your person at all times. So um, I mentioned like the antelope hunt codes, for example. So um, this uh, menu here, you can scroll down and you can actually jump to sections of the information booklet. And so say I was looking for deer uh, hunts and hunt codes. It's going to download another PDF version and it's going to open that screen. Can you see that deer screen on there, Tristiana? Yeah, maybe blow it up just a little bit so it's easier to read, but yes. Perfect. So you can read everything that there is in the booklet about deer um, in this section. So I'm going to scroll down um, to see what the hunt codes are going to look like. And these are still the private ones. So I'm going to go to the draws. So um, here we're looking at unit four. I can see the um, first one that's listed on here is archery. What's nice about um, the updated booklets is that it's broken down by unit. So I can see all the hunts that are available in one unit. And you're gonna see that those are gonna change from unit to unit. Even with this unit four Humphreys um, section is different than the unit 5A section. So um, unit four, there's a bow hunt, it's the uh, September 1st through the 24th. And then this next section here, this whole column is the hunt codes. That is what you will need in order to submit your applications, which we'll show you how to do here shortly as well. But that DER-2-139 is what you would wanna write down um, and put on your list. Uh, that way it's easy for you to uh, select it on the drop-down menu on your account. I can see the fee type, how many licenses exist for that hunt. And it tells me my bag limit, which is fork and or deer. Um, one little thing to point out on that is we do have different deer populations across the state. Uh, we have our Eastern whitetail deer and Coos whitetail. So if I scroll down to a unit like unit 23 that has mule deer and Coos whitetail in it, it's gonna tell me the differences in those. So um, I can see there's two hunts here that have fork antlered mule deer and fork antlered whitetail deer, um, which tells me which one to apply for. So just make sure that whenever you're selecting those hunt codes, that you're selecting the right one for the right species that you wanna go after. There are some hunts that are any fork antlered deer like this FAD one. Um, so make sure that you're paying attention to those as you're selecting those hunt codes as well. Awesome. 
So after you have your hunt codes and, um, you know, say you want to go hunting with a couple of buddies and attach your application. So how many people can attach on an application? So we can do up to four people on, um, almost every species except Oryx. Um, Oryx, we can only do two people per application. Um, but you can do four people on an application for deer. We did some uh, for a family today that wanted to hunt together. Um, kind of the trick with that is that it's an all or nothing system. So if you're applying four people on one application, if one of you draws, all of you draw. But uh, if one of you doesn't draw, that means all of you don't draw. Um, so it is kind of a catch 22 there. So just be mindful of uh, what you have planned for the year and what uh, odds you might want to increase with spreading out your applications. But it's great to be able to do that for families or folks that um, have a hunting buddy or something specific that they want to hunt with. Um, they can apply together. Yeah, I know you and I always approach that differently because I know <laughs> you and your husband always put in separately. So maybe one of you gets to go and maybe you both don't get a hunt. And then I always put in attached to my husband so that if we both go and can both hunt and harvest. <laughs> so it's two different approaches there. <laughs> yep, everyone has their own application strategy, which is the super cool thing about New Mexico too, that you can find um, and, and kind of figure out from year to year what works best for you, what things you might want to switch up for next year. Uh, we like to have as many tags as possible in one year. So uh, we never attach together and want to increase our draw odds. So um, it works for us. If you find something that works for you or uh, want to change it up from year to year, you can definitely have the opportunity to do that here. Absolutely. And so how do you go about attaching to an application? Like what's the, what's the process there? Yeah. So um, I'm going to maybe change just pages on here so you can see that. Um, so the way the attach um, application process works is figure out who you're going to be applying with. If it's you and your husband or you and your brother and your dad, whoever is going to be in your hunting party. Um, like I said, you have a limit on four of four hunters per application. Um, one of those individuals needs to be the primary applicant first. So somebody needs to go in, create the application, uh, submit the application, pay for it. Once the application has been submitted, the system is going to generate for you an application number and an attach code. You need those two things uh, in order to attach anybody else's um, application to yours. So once you have those two numbers, then you can give it to your husband or to your brother or your dad or whoever's going to be applying with you. Um, and they're going to log into their system the same way as you would when you apply. But instead of clicking create new application, they're going to select that second option that says attach to a previous application. You're going to click that option and it's going to ask you for that application number and that attach code. Again, you need both of those in order to apply. It'll then um, attach you to that application and add it to your cart. You'll also need to make sure to add your game hunting license and your stamps. You can also um, add your fishing license on there too, if it's applicable. And um, then you can check out if that's the only thing that you're gonna apply for is uh, what you attached onto a friend's or to a family member's application. Um, you can even attach to one application and create a whole new other application on your own for a different species. So say you wanted to attach with your husband for deer, but you wanted to apply on your own for elk, you can do that. Uh, you can't create two different applications for the same species. Uh, you can only create one per species per license here. So um, once you have attached to it, you pay for your license and your application and you're in the draw, you're set to go. Great, uh, yeah, and I, I would never attach for like a big horn cheap tag. <laughs> I know that's highly unlikely to, to even get one, let alone two, but um, no, that's great. And then if you apply, um, let's say three people attach together. Um, so all three are going to get licenses. All three have the opportunity to, to harvest an animal should the opportunity arise. Um, but what if, um, you know, if you just take your buddy with you and you, you apply on your own and then your friends just come along, then, then, who gets to shoot and, and who gets to hunt? That's a great question. Um, party hunting can be different from state to state. 
the way it works in New Mexico is that if you draw the license, you are the one that can shoot the animal. Um, there is a few different caveats that, that do come with that. If you have a mobility impaired card um, and shoot an animal and you have somebody with you um, that can help you finish off that animal if needed, that can take place. Um, but the person who has the license is the one that's responsible for pulling the trigger when they feel that um, opportunity presents itself. So nobody else in the hunting party can do that. Um, so, you know, one of the questions we get a lot too is, oh, well, if I apply, can I also take some friends with me? Absolutely. You can take whoever you want with you, but you are the one that um, has to pull the trigger when the time comes. Um, and one thing that should be noted about attaching applications to is the way our draw system here is based off of a quota. So it um, does give 84% to residents, 10% in the outfitter pool, and 6% to non-residents. So we have a lot of folks that are residents and want to apply with a friend or family member that may be a non-resident, and that can drastically change your draw odds um, because now you're essentially putting yourself in the non-resident pool, but if there's tags, uh, if your application comes up in the next sequence, when we're doing uh, awarding out tags and we have 10, say for example, we have 10 resident tags left, but there is zero non-resident tags left. That means you don't draw. Even though there's resident tags left, you guys attach together. So there would have to be a non-resident tag available also. Um, so it can be kind of tricky. Um, it is totally a gamble to do that. And there's certain hunts that um, probably aren't best to do that on, especially if there's not a lot of tags available. But if you're applying for hunts that have a lot of resident and non-resident tags in it, absolutely, you guys can attach together, but all comes back down to strategy. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> it's, it, when I was talking with Kevin, who works out of the same office with you, I asked him at the end, I was like, what's your number one advice? And he said, my first question to somebody is always, what are your goals with this hunt? And, and I think that's the same with attaching an application. It's, you know, do you want by yourself? Do you want cell phone reception? Do you want to stay in a hotel or cap in the back country? It's, it's all in your personal choices and, and what you want and what you have time for. So absolutely. Okay, so I think we answered those questions. So I want to okay. switch gears um, just to, well, I, I want to jump ahead in the process because we had a question on Facebook and it's probably the biggest question I've been asked all day today is when are results going to be out? Yes. <laughs> so so when, when should we res expect results? Uh, results are expected to post by April 27th. Um, in the past, we've been lucky and gotten some draw results early. Uh, fingers crossed that happens again this year, as long as the system goes good, but draw results will be available on your account and emails will be sent out um, by April 27th. So it, it'll be right around the corner. I know the, the longest time to wait is from uh, draw deadline to the day that draw results come out, but um, hopefully it goes by fast for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. And I would say get your harvest reports in as soon as possible, especially those of you that, that have until that April 7th deadline, because yes. the sooner those are in, the sooner they can start working on processing the draw. So get those in as soon as possible. <laughs> Absolutely. And a hit on harvest reports real quick. I know you, you mentioned it when we first jumped on the call, but um, a lot of folks right now are applying and we're noticing that they're not, they haven't submitted their harvest report for last year's deer, elk, pronghorn and turkey. So um, make sure to get those submitted before the um, draw deadline, which is Wednesday. Otherwise you will be kicked out of the draw. Um, right now it is past that February 15th deadline. So you will incur um, an $8 fee for submitting those late, but that $8 fee is better than getting kicked out of the draw. So make sure to get those submitted. Um, and then you have until April 7th to get um, Barbary, Ibex, Havelina and your trappers uh, or fur bearers harvest report submitted. So you still are required to get those submitted as well um, and make sure to get those done. Otherwise uh, the audit comes and uh, those folks who didn't get it submitted will be pulled out. So you guys definitely don't wanna miss out on your hunting season next year just because you forgot to submit a report. So get those in um, as soon as possible. <laughs> Absolutely. So when we have draw results come out, how does a person find out if they were successful or not in the draw? 
there's a few different uh, ways that results come out. Um, first off, you'll, you'll probably get an email from the department. So make sure you have a valid email in your customer account. That way we have a way to communicate with you of what you drew. Um, you'll get that email, but you can also log into your account, uh, click on, I believe it's draw applications and it'll show you all of the different um, applications and species that you applied for. <clears throat> Excuse me, right now, if you've applied, they all say pending. Um, once results have posted, hopefully you see a whole lot of green that says successful. Um, if you're unsuccessful, you're gonna see a red box that says unsuccessful. So I hope lots of you see green this year, um, but you can be able to check it online. You can check it um, in your email or you can give us a call. We can look up your account and check out your draw results for you as well. Absolutely. Great. Uh, so thank you. So I wanted to, let's jump back in. I'm jumping all around our, our outline. So I apologize. Okay. But um, one of the other questions I've gotten a bunch today, I feel like I've gotten a lot of different questions, but I have gotten this one quite a bit today as well. But um, when can somebody start buying a fishing license or a 2022 spring turkey tag? Great question. And we've been getting it a lot here at our office as well. So um, the new license year does not start until April 1st, but you can start um, purchasing and printing out your um, 2022 hunting license starting March 23rd. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unfortunately, we can't print any of that out for you right now. Um, any of those over-the-counter tags like turkey or barbary or bear will not be available until after March 23rd. Uh, to get printed. So we've gotten our new car carcass tags here in the office um, so we can get those printed out for you as well. And the uh, local licensed vendors will be receiving those shortly. Um, but starting March 23rd, you'll be able to get your new fishing license or uh, new hunting licenses for 2022. Awesome. Okay. So uh, the 23rd, so next Wednesday is when you can next start Wednesday. those. And I think you mentioned that we had a new carcass tag coming we out do. this year. So I actually have a sample. Ooh. So this is what it's going to look like this year. Um, and I did want to plug it because I was talking to our licensing manager last week, and it's going to be a little bit different than in the past where you've had the sticky back and you've had to remove it. Mm -hmm. um, so this one, it doesn't have a sticky back. Sorry if it's a little hard to see, but it doesn't have a sticky back, even though it looks the same as our, as our old ones. So you'll have to find a way to um, pull, the, you know, fill out the information, fold it over and attach it to your your harvested animal. Um, so make sure when you're packing your bags to plan for uh, some sort of duct tape, or I think I'm gonna plan on a plastic bag with a zip tie. And that way, you know, I don't cover up any of the valuable information on there, um, but make sure and, you know, check out the new licenses. Cause if you're looking at the paper one, it's gonna be a little different than in years past. And it does tell you right on the back. It gives you directions just as it always has mm -hmm. on how to use it. Yep, we, we've noticed that as well, and we um, kind of have visited with some of our uh, field operations and our conservation officers on that as well, on what to advise the public on, on how to handle that so that our officers can properly check those licenses, and you nailed it. Uh, carry a plastic bag. I usually put my tags in a plastic bag anyways, because um, I'm prone to getting dirty or, you know, getting it wet or damaged or something. Um, so put it in a plastic baggie, um, carry a couple of the small zip ties. That way you can um, attach it to the, um, to your animal. Um, but probably a couple plastic bags would be recommended for these new carcass tags um, so that they don't get, you know, super wet or uh, fall apart. If you put uh, your meat in your cooler or something like that. Um, you're still going to have the antler section and the carcass tag section. So you'll still need to notch both of those and attach both of those to the corresponding um, body parts uh, whenever you're uh, packing out and whenever you're at camp. So uh, carrying around some zip ties and plastic baggies is going to be the way to go this year with those carcass tags. Get, get prepared. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and of course, the e tag. If you like to have the e tag, that is a, an option as well again this year. Yes, the e tags um, going to be an option. Again, with that one, you'll still have to uh, write down that confirmation number once you've tagged it and attach it to your animal as well. And sorry, I feel like I'm losing my voice. So I hope everybody can hear me. Okay, but talk to a lot of people today. So as I know yes. you have, Holly. 
so switching gears um, just a little bit, one of the questions that came in here in Zoom um, and that you know we hear pretty frequently is somebody applied for a hunt and um, it, it they ended up you know clicking the wrong box and it wasn't the hunt they wanted or they want to change their mind and attach to somebody. So what do you do? Um, can you just go in and edit your choices or, or what do you have to do? This happens all the time. Um, and uh, unfortunately it happens, but um, the easiest way to do it for the customer is to log into your account. Um, you can review your applications and you can delete your application. Uh, we cannot log into your account and delete it on our end. You're going to need to log into your own account and delete your application. And then you're going to have to reapply for that species. So say if it's for elk and you put in an antlerless instead of a mature bull, you know, you may have just switched one code which is easy to do, um, but make sure, you know, you're double checking those before you hit submit and pay. Um, so if you have paid, you've checked out, and then you go back and notice, oh, I either selected the wrong one, or you know what, I wanna change it. If that maybe isn't where I wanna go or the hunt that I wanna go on, you can go in and delete your application up until the draw deadline, which is tomorrow at five, um, and you'll have to reapply you will be uh, subtracted your application fee. So if you're a resident, you will still have to pay that $7 fee. If you're non-resident, it's $14, um, but you will get refunded within, I think it's uh, 10 to 14 business days on getting that license um, application back um, onto your card, but then you'll also see that new charge for your new application that you've edited correctly. Um, so unfortunately you can't go in and edit a previously submitted application, um, but you can go and delete it and reapply before the draw deadline. We get that question a lot too, and we uh, definitely encourage folks to make sure they're entering in those right um, those right numbers, uh, hunt code numbers in advance. And that's why it's really important to to look at the rule and information booklet every year um, because those. Uh, hunt codes can change. Um, we've had a lot of folks that have called uh, with last year's hunt codes and they're for different units or different areas, um, different seasons, and uh, it's not what they wanted to apply for. So make sure you have those right hunt codes, really important. Absolutely. And one thing I learned last week, I hadn't experienced this before, but I had a person who attached to uh, another hunter and then he realized he used a company credit card instead of his personal oh. credit card. Yep. And so he deleted his application and went back in and couldn't reattach. And what I learned last week is that our system doesn't allow you to reattach an application. And so what they had to do were, was him and his friend had to go and delete both applications. Yeah. And then they both had to reapply and attach. I was a, a tedious process, but a, a lesson learned. <laughs> that one's definitely a doozy. Yeah, when you have those attached applications that you have to modify, yeah, everybody that's attached to it has to delete it and redo it. So um, it can make it pricey uh, to, it's a pricey mistake to make. Absolutely. And I'm gonna back up just a second because I got, I got a text um, on a topic we talked about just a minute ago on the the e-tag. Mm -hmm. And I wanna make sure and clarify that if you use the e-tag as your um, as your license instead of a printed copy, you do still have to do the harvest report. So the e-tag doesn't replace the harvest report. You have to do, no matter if you have a paper or you have the e-tag, you do have to do that harvest report. So make sure and, and get that done if you haven't already. And you have to submit that harvest report even if you did not harvest anything, it is still mandatory. That's a great point. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want to do a little myth busting because <laughs> one of my um, favorite questions, and I get it all throughout the year, um, is does it help your odds if you apply right at the beginning of the application opening or right at the end of when it's closing? So does it affect my odds depending on when I apply? No, it does not right. affect your odds of when you apply. We have a lot of folks that are superstitious also that want to apply on the very first day. Um, those of you that do that, I thank you because <laughs> it, it helps when we have a lot more people do it on the front end than on the back end because uh, our system does get bogged down the more people that delay and procrastinate and wait till the last day. That being said, we have a lot of folks 
that only apply on the last day. Um, they may have drawn some really, really good tags, you know, one year, and it was because they applied on a certain date at a certain time, and that's what they're going to do from now on. Absolutely, whatever works for you, but um, the time and date does not affect uh, your application or your draw odds. So um, once it's submitted, it's submitted, and then all of those applications are assigned a random sequence number, um, and your application is pulled by sequence number. So it is still lottery system um, of your applications and what gets uh, what application gets drawn in what order. Absolutely. Um, and another myth I want, I haven't heard this one before. So uh, switching gears to another myth, but um, I'm just going to, I'm going to read this. So bear with okay. me for a second. The draw <laughs> is one animal per person per year. Yes. So if you apply for multiple species, if your random draw number for one of your application comes up and can be filled, you're done at that point, right? I think what he's asking is if you can only draw one species a year or if you can get sequenced and draw multiple species a year. You can be sequenced and draw multiple species per year. However, there's some applications that include multiple species. So uh, you can draw an elk and a deer tag. So each application is assigned its own sequence number. It's not... Um, I get a sequence number for all my applications and you get a sequence number for your application. It is per application per species. Um, but as we saw with those deer hunt codes, there's mule deer hunt codes, um, there's white tailed deer hunt codes. So deer is its own application, but you can apply for mule deer and coos deer on one application. The same could be said for sheep. Um, bighorn sheep, you can apply for Rocky Mountain, and desert um, bighorn sheep on the same application. However, you can only draw one species. So you're only gonna draw one of those hunt codes. I hope that answers that question. <laughs> yes, no, I, I hadn't heard it asked that way before. So I wanted to address it. And it's, you know, last year I went in and looked at, at my applications and I had one species where I was um, like under a thousand for my sequence. So I was like, that's awesome. And right. then I went and looked at, I think it was my elk last year. I was like 16,000 something or other. I was way down there. So yeah. <laughs> I knew there was no way I would ever get that elk tag last year. They, but They can change, definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay. I wanted to make sure I got all of those kind of questions. Um, okay. I So... If you, going back to changing your application, um, mm -hmm. so say somebody's already put in for elk, but they want to go back in and apply for deer because they haven't done that already. Mm -hmm. um, what's the best way to do that? Do you have to delete or can you attach or um, can you just apply? So if you've already applied for elk, you can go back in and apply for any species um, after that, as long as it's before the draw deadline. Um, we actually have a lot of folks that do this, um, especially to spread out um, the application fee, um, you know, having to pay, if you applied for everything, having to pay for, you know, 800 and some odd dollars up front is a lot of money. So, um, you know, we have a lot of folks that as soon as the draw opens, they may apply for elk and deer, and they may wait a few weeks to the next payday, and they may do oryx, may wait again and apply for javelina or pronghorn. Um, you can certainly spread out your applications. Um, I'll do some myth debunking on that too. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't change your draw odds if you do that. It just changes how well your bank account handles that, that many charges. Um, so you can certainly spread those out um, and, and go back in and it, you would apply the same way as you did if you did elk first um, and you wanted to wait a couple of weeks to do deer, you would just log back into your account, uh, click on uh, that um, application button and uh, do your deer application next and get that submitted and paid for. Perfect. Okay, next question from here in Zoom. Um, so the, the fire sale or the leftover license sale for deer, is that considered a draw? It is not. It is a fire sale. So any tags, um, and to give some background information about that uh, fire sale verbiage, is any tags um, that 
were in the draw originally, um, but were undersubscribed, meaning we didn't have as many people apply and receive those tags as there were tags. Uh, for example, if we had a hunt that had 100 tags, but only 50 people applied for um, and received tags for, that means we have 50 tags left over. Um, Later on in the summer, we will put any remaining leftover tags on sale. Um, and it is a fire sale because they go like that. Um, they go super fast. People log in. The first 24 hours is open to residents. And then after that, it's open to non-residents to purchase um, any remaining uh, licenses. The, the list of available licenses is usually made available to the public one to two weeks before that sale takes place. So you can take a look and see if you didn't draw a deer tag, you can see maybe what tags might be available in um, the, the fire sale and see if that's one that you wanna purchase. I highly recommend being logged in at the time that they go on sale and be ready to add it to your cart because they go fast. Um, so if you want one, you, you gotta be ready for it. Um, so that uh, it, it's not a draw, for those remaining tags, it is a sale, but those tags were in the draw previously. Perfect. Okay, not touching gifts to Havelina. Um, so there are some Havelina tags that you can apply for the draw, but there's also some over the counter. So what are the differences and how should you know if you should apply or just get an over the counter? So Havelina has been one of these species that has grown tremendously in, popula in popularity the last couple of years. So there is areas that you can apply for, um, and there are areas that are over the counter. And the areas that you can apply for are units 19, 23 through 27. So it's kind of that Southwest corner of the state, that boot heel area. So that includes um, South of Las Cruces, um, South of I-10, all the way West to the Arizona border, and then unit 23, uh, which runs from Deming, Lordsburg, uh, north up to Luna. So it includes those units in the draw. There is a rifle uh, hunt and there is a archery hunt. So if you look at that code in the proclamation, um, the rifle always starts with a one. Any archery hunt is a two. So if it's JAV-1-100, um, that's the rifle hunt. And if it's 2-102, uh, then it's the archery hunt. So that kind of gives you an idea when you're looking at those codes of which weapon you're going to be putting in for. The, um, the rifle hunts have about 1,000 tags and the archery hunts have about 300 tags. So uh, that could also change your strategy when applying for them on, do you want to go for the one that has the least amount of tags first? What's your weapon preference? Um, what's your time limit? Because there's different time and seasons for each one of those hunts as well. Um, there are what we refer to over-the-counter licenses that are not required to be put in the draw because you can come by a vendor or to our office and purchase one of these licenses. And that's for any other unit that is not included in those draw zones. Um, so if it's any unit other than 19 through 23 through 27, you can hunt heavily in those areas. Um, the last uh, two years has kind of seen unprecedented uh, license sales that we have sold out of our over-the-counter javelina uh, licenses. There's a thousand licenses available for each one or for the over-the-counter as well. Um, and the season goes until March 31st. So you fellow javelina hunters out there that haven't tagged out yet, you have about two weeks left. I'm going to get out there again, hopefully myself and, and find some javelina, but um, yeah, they have sold out. So if you think that you're um, going to be able to purchase a license in the next two weeks and go out, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there are no more. <laughs> um, so make sure to get those early um, before they sell out. Absolutely. I hadn't heard they sold out. I, that's exciting to hear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the weather's sold looking out. pretty good. Yeah. I think they sold out like early February. Um, and season opens middle of January. So they, they sold out fairly quickly. Perfect. Okay, next question, changing gears a little bit again. Um, if you do draw a hunt and, and you don't wanna go or you can't go, can you get your money back on that? Or what can you do with that tag? 
So there's a few different things, um, and it certainly depends on the circumstances in which you cannot go on the hunt. If you decided that you drew a tag that um, you're just not that thrilled about or that you changed your mind and you didn't want to do it, um, unfortunately, you're you're out of the boat on that one. Um, if you have some sort of life-threatening injury, um, if you pass away, heaven forbid, or if uh, you get deployed on a, on a military orders, um, you do have the option to transfer that tag to somebody else or petition the director uh, to get a refund for that tag. But it is very case by case basis. Um, going back to the prior, if you decide that you drew a tag and you got sick or say something else came up of a time conflict that you have to be somewhere else instead, um, you have the option of actually donating that tag back to the department. Um, that's something that we see a lot of folks do. And I can tell you, it creates this whole new amazing opportunity for another hunter. If you donate that tag back, it goes um, to our licensing office. They have a list of approved nonprofit organizations that will find a veteran, a first responder, or a youth hunter that is able to accept that donation and go on that hunt. So that tag still gets used. Um, I personally did that myself this year. I drew a coos tag um, in January and I wasn't able to go. I just started this awesome job and uh, just didn't have the time. And, and, but I didn't want the tag to go to waste either. So I donated it back to the department and they found um, a group who found a veteran to go on that hunt. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's great to still see it get used. You do not get your money back if you donate that tag back, um, but it creates an opportunity for somebody who maybe didn't have a tag or maybe didn't have the financial means to get a tag before um, the, the fees of that are covered. So um, it's a great way to still make sure that tag gets utilized, but unfortunately you don't get your money back on that. But those are a couple different ways on, if you can't go on a hunt, what to do. I've never donated a tag myself, but I know my dad has donated one very, I don't know, probably five or six times. And, um, he, he hunts in Arizona where he lives. And, um, I know that he had a pronghorn tag that he donated back to a young lady who, um, had very serious cancer and she harvested and the pictures that their family sent where she was just beaming and their family was just so close and tight and sharing that moment. And it just like, it made me want to cry. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was, it was a tremendous experience. From my previous experience, we got to work with some folks who we had to find recipients for. And I can tell you, it's one of, it, it is the best way to make your day when you can call somebody and tell them, Hey, do you want to go hunting this weekend? Cause I have a tag available for you. And the joy and the excitement that come from the parents or the the youth hunter or the veteran is just the most sincere, genuine appreciation and it, it makes it all worth it. So I, I always encourage folks, if you can, um, if you can't go on a hunt, help somebody else go on a hunt and donate the tag back. It's super simple, easy process. You just contact the department and let them know, I want to donate this tag back. And our uh, folks at the licensing office do a fantastic job on getting that uh, process taken care of for you. Absolutely. And I would put that plug in there because as well is that if you know somebody that wants to go, I mean, you can't just give them your tag, but encourage them to apply for the draw and take them out. I've, I know I've taken several first time hunters out and it's, it makes me feel just so happy for them when they have this experience. And it's, it's definitely worth sharing um, your passion with somebody who, who's trying to learn and trying to get out there and um, it, it makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> It, it really does. And, you know, speaking from somebody who's gotten to take a lot of first timers out as well, you learn a whole lot more and you kind of appreciate the process and a totally different set of eyes um, from them. But, you know, think of it this way too, of how did you learn how to hunt? Did you grow up with somebody teaching you? Some of these folks may not have had that person. So you get to become that person and and help take them out and teach them um, how to hunt, which is uh, an amazing experience. And it, you know, you do all the same things that they do, except pull the trigger. So um, it, it's still just as rewarding and, 
and challenge at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to keep an eye for more questions to come in. The last one that I have um, in my outline that we haven't got to yet is if somebody has applied for the draw, um, you know, you, you have to purchase your hunting license or your hunting and fishing license up front. You have to purchase the HAMAV, the Habitat Access Validation, I'm off a letter, Habitat Management and Access Validation stamp. But the Habitat stamp, um, the $10 one, you can, it's optional in that process. So if you haven't purchased it, when do you have to purchase it by um, it, and will it affect your draw results? That's a great thing to note because we see a lot of issues um, with that stamp throughout the year and at the time of application, a lot of confusion of what do I do? Do I need this? What is it for? Um, so I'm happy to kind of address that. So the Habitat stamp is now a $10 uh, additional fee that goes into our habitat stamp fund, um, which helps support habitat projects with the BLM and the forest service across the state. Um, they have put millions of dollars back into projects that benefit wildlife, um, both for hunting and non-game species too. It benefits when they do these projects, it benefits everything that's on the landscape. So even if you don't hunt, you can purchase one of these stamps and support uh, habitat improvement projects here in New Mexico. But at the time of application, you know what, it's gonna ask you some prompts of make sure to get your hunting license and do you wanna add your fishing license and do you wanna add a second rod? You know, some of those are optional um, and habitat stamp is too at the time of application. You are not required to purchase it at the time of application, however, if you draw a license that you're applying for and you plan to hunt or fish on public land in New Mexico that license year, you will be required to purchase that stamp. A lot of folks bypass it and then they draw a tag and they're all excited and they go out and they forgot to get their stamp. And it is a quick way <laughs> to get a citation from one of our officers by not having that stamp. So, um, my personal recommendation and just to make it easy is make your $10 donation, get your stamp at the time of application. That way you're not missing anything when you do draw. Um, I would hate to have made all these plans and, and spend all this money and get so excited for this elk hunt. And then I'm missing one $10 thing. It, it's $10. So, you know, I, I don't want to miss out on that. The, the fee the citation fee is much more than that. So um, it's safe bet of just add it to your cart at the time. If you apply and don't purchase that stamp um, at the time of application, you can purchase it later. Um, so if you find out that you draw and you're like, sweet, I got this awesome elk tag in 16A. It's mostly, I'm mostly gonna be hunting on the wilderness or on the, the Gila National Forest. I'm gonna need that stamp. You can log into your account and purchase that stamp directly through your customer account, or you can come by one of the area offices, give us a call, we can get that processed for you as well. Just, just make sure that you have everything that you need before you go out in the field, including all of those stamps. So um, just make sure that you purchase it before your hunt starts. Absolutely. Um, and one of the questions that just came in on Facebook, and I think it's a, a great question that I wanna to touch on, um, is there any way to volunteer to help out with hunts or kids, vets, mobility impaired hunts? Oh, that is a great question. Um, there are definitely ways that you can volunteer and sign up with the department. Um, you can actually go to our website. Um, let me see if I can pull it up real quick and I can do a screen share to, to show you. Um, but you can go to our website and enroll as a volunteer. Um, there's a couple things that need uh, to happen. Uh, we have to do a background check. We have to, um, you know, make sure that, that you're able to be a, a volunteer with the department and get you all squared away. Um, and then um, there's a variety of different things that you can help with with the department, um, it, whether it's a hunt or something like that. But there's also a lot of um, hunter education classes that need to happen archery in the schools programs, um, OHV courses as well, but there's a lot of nonprofit organizations out there 
they're always looking for volunteers and folks to help them. Um, and you can, we've had some of them. Um, I know on these on these live events, we've had some come in on our ladies' hours. Um, so you can, you know, go back and watch some of those videos, or you can look up Mexico conservation organizations um, and and reach out to those volunteers or those organizers and see what you can help with. Um, they're always looking for folks to help and step up. So. Uh, whoever asked the question, I, I strongly encourage you to, to get involved and do that. It would be great. Absolutely. And you just reminded me that I was going to share my screen <laughs> and talk about the Bighorn Sheep Draw, because um, I find it, I think that it's one of the more confusing in the application process that we have. It is. Uh, there we go. Can you see my screen okay? I can. Okay. Um, so if I get off track, correct me, because I know you have done this more than I have. Um, but basically what you're going to do when you come in and I'm in the big horn sheep here, um, whoops, so you can see right there, big horn sheep. Um, the first thing you're going to do is select if you want to apply for your first choice as a Rocky or a desert. And so if you look in the rules and information booklet, the 201 is your Rockies and the 204 is your deserts. The 202 are your U hunts. Um, so if you want to apply for Rockies, you can come in, select the BHS-1-201, and then you're given three options under that Rocky tab. So you can come over here, click on this first choice, and you can select. So if you really like the Wheeler Peak area, you can select that as your first choice, either the August or the September hunt. And then you get a second choice for Rockies. So you'll wanna come in here and say, you know, the dry summer on's pretty cool. This is a, a long hunt in there. It's a lot of private land, but they have some really good sheep up there. So you can put your second choice as the dry summer on. And I'm not recommending these by any means because they are all phenomenal opportunities. <laughs> Check out the episode with Caitlin where we talked about all of these hunts if you, if you want more information. Um, and then let's say uh, the Pecos for a wilderness hunt um, here for my third choice. So I would apply for Rockies, you get three choices under Rockies, and then I would come down and do, again, um, an illegal, maybe? Takes it a second. This is perfect example of the closer we get to draw deadline, the more bogged down our system gets. <laughs> so Absolutely. Do these early, because these are things that start to happen. Now you're gonna, um, yeah, select any legal weapon. So this should pop up <laughs> with the same drop down as up here. So you would you would just imagine that you would have this big horn sheep dash one dash two oh four, except for it would be your second choice. And I'm not sure why. My guess is that I logged into my account about an hour and a half ago, and it's timing yeah. me out a little bit. So I'm guessing that's the issue right now. But you could essentially come in here, um, select your rocky. Oh, sorry, your desert, and then. Again, this is not going to update as fast as I want it to, but you would also get three choices for your desert. Um, so my great idea to just show this isn't working as smoothly as I wanted, but keep in mind, you're essentially going to get three choices is your Rocky or your desert for your first and your second. Um, your U could be your third if you want to put it for you. You can't put in the U for your first and second, but that's not the way most people would go about that. And then for each of the the Rockies, the desert, and the U hunt, you would get three choices under each of those. So, yep, is that the, clear as mud since it's not showing the way it should be showing? Yeah, so just to reiterate on that too, you get three choices for Rockies, you get three choices of areas for deserts, um, and you get three choices if you did any legal weapon use. If you selected the archery option, I think there's only two hunts, uh, two archery hunts, so you only get two there. Um, so essentially going back to the multiple species question too, that's a good example of that is uh, where you can apply for multiple species, but it's one application because it's bighorn sheep. So um, make sure that that gets entered correctly. And then, um, you know, once you scroll down on that page, I don't know if you can pull that back up, Tristiana. Sure. I just wanted to hit on the e-tag option on there because that's been something that we've gotten a lot of questions on from folks. Um, so this bottom section, folks, you can see the carcass tag requirement. So there are two check boxes here. You have to select one of them in order to add this application to your cart. If you want to do an e-tag, which means you download the app 
onto your phone and you plan to tag that animal uh, via the app, you would select e-tag. If you want to receive a paper carcass tag, that nice pretty purple one that Tristiana showed earlier, you're gonna select the tag confirmation and you're gonna confirm your mailing address on here. You cannot select both. If you select both, it's gonna kick back an error and being, it, being really mad at you. And then you're gonna get frustrated because now the page is giving you these errors and you selected all the things. Um, this is where we're seeing a lot of people have issues um, before they're able to add it to their cart. So if you wanna do e-tag, click e-tag. If you wanna do a paper carcass tag, click the tag confirmation box, and then you'll be able to add it to your cart. Just wanted to hit on that real quick. <laughs> No, that's a, a great point and uh, one we should definitely talk about. <laughs> okay, I think we are nearing um, the end of the conversation. Um, we do have a couple of questions in here about draw odds and about um, uh, hunt success rates. And I would I would encourage you if you haven't done so to go back and watch the episode with Kevin Rodden. It was from mid February, um, where we talked about reading the draw odds report um, and the um, the harvest reports can all be found on our website. I find it's easiest on our website to use the search function and search draw odds or harvest reports. It, by far, it's the way I do everything on our website is just doing that search function. <laughs> um, so make yeah. sure and check that out because I, I think it'll help clarify a lot of um, you know, the questions that are coming up on Facebook right now. And I don't want to delve into that because we could be here until, well, tomorrow trying to dig into those reports. Draw um, odds are their own beast. Um, but like Tristiana said, you can go to our website and you can download um, the draw report or the odds report. Um, it's an Excel document and you can look and see the distribution and the number of applicants for second and third choice for all the different hunt codes that we have. So you can see what those draw odds look like and do, do a little calculation and some, that's where the statistics class comes in handy. Um, and you can put some of that to real life use and, and download that report and take a look at it. I rely on it a ton. Kevin did a phenomenal job explaining and learning how to read that report correctly. So I highly recommend going back and watching that episode as well. Absolutely. Okay, so my last question for you, Colleen, is the one I ask everybody, but what is your number one tip for somebody who is applying or wants to go hunting for the first time in New Mexico? So first time applicants, um, and actually really any applicants, is have realistic goals and expectations um, and do your homework. That is definitely not only going to help you in preparing for your hunt, but it definitely helps you in applying. And if our team is going to be helping you with your applications, if you've already gotten your hunt codes prepared and you um, have all of them written down, you know what you wanna do, you are ready. It helps alleviate um, and streamline the process on our end to get you applied um, instead of just hunt areas or draw dates. Um, we really do need those hunt codes to get you applied. So during your homework on, the, on those um, units and on those hunts would definitely help anyone out, whether you're a first time applicant or not. Um, and, and then also having those realistic goals, kind of what do you, what do you expect out of that hunt and what kind of experience do I want to have? Um, is it realistic for me to be going solo? Is it going to be realistic for me to have a bunch of people go with me? Um, what kind of animals can I expect in those areas? And a lot of the, um, you know, Q and A's that we've already done, give you some really good information on the quality and quantity and populations um, of different wildlife across the state. So, you know, use that information to your advantage. So that way you're not going into a hunt where you think every bull that walks out is gonna be 400 inches. Um, that's an easy way to get let down if you're only seeing 350 inch bulls. <laughs> um, but I would, I, it certainly helps the experience and your workload going into it if you have done the homework and you have realistic expectations. I would absolutely agree with that. 
Okay, so I think we've answered most of the questions or referred them to um, other other web, website, other web, webinars. There we go. I <laughs> come up with the name. But I wanted to say thank you to you and to the 14 other people that have joined me on these webinars because I feel like we have covered a wide range of topics. <laughs> and um, I'm pretty sure there is probably over 20 hours worth of webinars that people can go and, and learn about about everything. So um, so thank you to everybody who has supported um, this session. I had in my notes to talk about what's next week, and I don't have one scheduled for next week. I am taking the week off <laughs> from a webinar. Uh, I'm not. We have the lady social hour. So maybe I'm not taking a week off from a webinar. But, <laughs> Forgot about um, that one already. <laughs> um, I do want to share those dates one more time because mm -hmm. they are approaching rapidly. Um, there we go. So uh, if you haven't applied already, um, I know somebody just messaged me that they were applying right now. So um, good job. Um, and I have mine in. Colleen, do you have your applications in already? All of mine are done. I got my fingers crossed and I'm praying to the hunting gods that we get something good. <laughs> I would ask you for your like happy, like wish me luck dance, but I, I think we're just going to skip that portion. <laughs> you don't want to see that. <laughs> so yeah. So if you haven't done it yet, you do still have time. You have until five o'clock on Wednesday um, to, to get those applications in. Um, and like I said, we are here until eight o'clock tonight. So about 24 more minutes um, answering phone calls at that one 888-248-6866 number. So if you don't, um, I am looking at the list right now. We have a few people on phone calls, but we have 12 people and no wait. So if you have a question specific to your account, give us a call because we are ready to help right now. Um, tomorrow, we will be answering phones from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, a, a pro tip, as you said earlier, um, today we were really slow in the morning and after about 5.30. So, so if you have questions, call us first thing in the morning um, and, and we'll see if we can help you. And then on Wednesday, we have our phones open from 8 a.m. to 4.30. And we do cut the phones off at 4.30 because we tend to have such a long wait that we can't help people get into the draw. So, so definitely don't wait until the last minute. Um, I'm, I'm pleading with you to not wait until the last minute to get those in. Um, so uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. We, and, and throughout the entire series, we greatly appreciate it. And Colleen, I know you've been so busy helping customers um, in the Crusoe's and on phones. So thank you so much for your time and energy to, to be here with us for an hour and a few extra minutes this evening. Absolutely. Thank you for having me and thank you for putting these together. I know a lot of folks are very appreciative of a lot of this information and um, being transparent to the public. So thank you, Tristiana. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight and uh, best of luck to everyone on the draw. Absolutely. Here's for the green. So, <laughs> and good night, everyone.